night. Yeah. All right, I guess we can get going. So we're glad to start an, another week of lectures after continuing she from last week. So we're beginning Tom Hartman, glad to have, talking to us about um, black holes and quantum fields. All right, thank you. Um, hello, everybody. I don't know most of you, but I hope to um, meet you all this week and, and um, talk to you. So please do. Stop me with questions. Um, you know, catch me in the coffee breaks in the afternoons. I'll be I'll be around. Um, so 
I hope that these lectures can just sort of be the starting point, and then we can um, all talk about uh, all these topics throughout the week. And I'll be here the first half uh, of next week, too. So I gave, I gave a vague title to avoid uh, pinning myself down. Uh, but what I'm actually going to talk about uh, are uh, advanced, some, some advanced topics in black hole thermodynamics. Okay, so um, you all know the basic story, I think, that when we have a black hole, uh, if we perturb it, then it obeys the laws of thermodynamics. And it obeys those laws with some simple universal formulas, like entropy is area over 4, uh, and uh, so on. The Hawking temperature has a simple formula. And these laws are universal for black holes. If you throw something at a black hole, then you know it's going to respond like a thermodynamic system. And it's going to respond like a thermodynamic system with a very large number of degrees of freedom, because formulas like this are in Planck units. And if you plug in numbers uh, that for area over 4, um, I think I plugged in numbers at some point for the black hole at the middle of the Milky Way and uh, learned that that black hole has 2 to the 10 to the 85 microstates. OK, so we're talking about enormous numbers of degrees of freedom. Uh, and uh, that's just the tip of the iceberg. So uh, these quasi-static quasi stationary perturbations of black holes led to the laws of black hole mechanics, black hole thermodynamics. Uh, the next sort of layer up from there is hydrodynamics. And there's a whole relationship between uh, Einstein's equations and the equations of hydrodynamics. So these are uh, sort of, uh, these, these take thermodynamics to the next level, to sort of a local thermodynamics. Uh, but uh, what ADS CFT gives us. Uh, is it gives us a microscopic theory for uh, uh, underlying, uh, underlying the hydrodynamic or the thermodynamic description. And uh, that's a quantum field theory. So uh, the thermodynamics of the black hole is, is the ordinary statistical mechanics of that quantum field theory. And um, we've begun to understand sort of how the microscopic degrees of freedom of the quantum field theory behave together, how they organize, how they uh, create uh, the black hole, and how they create hydrodynamics and thermodynamics and everything else that black holes do. Um, there's another layer here, which is uh, sort of uh, the microscopic definition of the QFT. So this would be something like N equals 4 Cypriang Mills, where we uh, have some particular quantum field theory in mind that we can write down the Lagrangian, we can write down the exact uh, description of the theory, at least in principle, and then we can try to solve it. Uh, what I'm going to focus on in these lectures is, is sort of this, this layer of the onion. Okay, So is going from basic principles in quantum field theory, uh, and from basic principles in quantum field theory and statistical mechanics of quantum systems uh, to black holes. Okay, so that's my goal. It's to describe um, in a way that goes beyond the old story of um, black hole thermodynamics and small fluctuations, how it is that, that some of the interesting aspects of black holes are captured in quantum field theory. And um, I'm going to start at the beginning with uh, QFT at finite temperature. This is something you can read whole textbooks about, take whole classes about. Um, I'll try to, uh, in a lecture or two, um, describe the basics uh, starting at the beginning. I'm going to do this from a path integral perspective. So this is a perspective that I think will be uh, familiar to people here. Um, and as a way that I like to think about it, it's also a very handy way of, of thinking about it for getting started with black holes. Then I'm going to talk about QFT 
versus black holes. So I want to describe just what the basic relationship is uh, in ADS CFT. And by the way, I'm not going to talk, I'm actually not going to, in these lectures, I'm not going to talk about black hole physics hardly at all. I'm just going to draw all these pictures of black holes and, and sort of tell you interesting things that they do. But all of the, all the actual material that we're, cover, that we're covering is going to be quantum field theory. So we're, we're going to, all the calculations we do are going to be quantum field theory. At, at a couple points, I'm going to have to pull black hole results out of the literature and, and tell you about them. But I'll, I'll just describe them qualitatively um, just, so that, so just so that we can focus on the QFT. So in the end, it, it'll, all be, it'll all be QFT that we're doing. Um, so after we've done the, so in these first two parts, um, this will be uh, setting up the basic picture. In part three, I will describe um, scrambling and chaos in quantum field theory. Uh, these are topics that are motivated, that were motivated, uh, or studying these topics in quantum field theory was motivated by looking at uh, perturbations of black holes. But these are just things that you can study in QFT. And then, um, depending on timing, we may or may not, um, I may or may not do the last lecture on what's called the modular bootstrap, uh, which is a way of understanding the spectrum of uh, two-dimensional quantum field theories. Uh, and their relation to three-dimensional gravity. But I don't know if we'll get to that one, and that's fine. Um, I'd, rather, I'd rather cover, the, cover these topics um, slowly, and please ask me questions. Slow me down, um, and we don't have to get to that one. We can talk about that one um, in private. OK, so Starting with part one, uh, these will maybe roughly follow the four lectures. I'm not sure about that, though. We'll see. OK, so starting in part one, QFT at finite temperature. I actually want to start with just a very quick uh, description of path integrals to get everyone on the same page, uh, because I think the relationship between path integrals and, and quantum states is sometimes lost a little bit um, in the books. So let me just start by writing the Lorentzian path integral. Of course, the defining feature of this is that it calculates transition amplitudes uh, between field configurations uh, or states in the field basis. So the transition amplitude from the state phi 1 in time t to the state phi 2, phi two is the Lorentzian path integral with boundary condition phi 1 at t equals 0, boundary condition phi 2 at time t of e to the i s of phi. And the reason I'm writing these formulas is because I never want to write them again. And I want to define for you a pictorial notation for this, which I'm going to be using, uh, which is um, this. OK, so this is, this is, I'm defining for you what this picture means. I'm going to put a phi 1 here, a phi 2 here, and uh, a t here. Um, so phi 1 is a function only of x. It's just a function on space. Uh, and when I draw pictures like this, I'm uh, writing for you a path integral. OK? Euclidean path integrals also calculate transition amplitudes. Uh, in this case, they calculate uh, transition. They they calculate the action of e to the minus h tau. Um, so these I'm going to draw uh, basically the same way, except I'll call it tau instead of t. Uh, well, let me write the formula first. Now it's integral d phi e to the minus s Euclidean of phi. Uh, and I'll draw this um, as a path integral from 
phi 1 to phi 2. But now um, I'll call it tau, and that's how we know it's Euclidean. Um, a lot of times I'm going to take Euc the Euclidean time direction to come out of the board, but I'm not very good at drawing these pictures, and um, I'll, have to, I'll have to explain to you what, what they're supposed to look like as we go. OK, so these, these pictures are going to be important. Does this make sense? Um, so I don't want to have to keep writing path integrals. Any questions at this point? Yeah. The fields at time. No, I, I have not assumed that. Ah, you're talking about the fact that, that the Hamiltonian is time translation invariant? Uh, that's right. So uh, otherwise, there would be some path ordered. Otherwise, we'd have to do some complicated path ordering if the Hamiltonian was depending on time. I've assumed that the Hamiltonian is, is independent of time here. Other questions? Yeah. Well, integration is a linear operation. So, so in the same way that, that ah, sorry, I'm supposed to repeat the question. <laughs> the question was how we deal with superpositions and other kinds of states. You know, the basic the basic statement of the path integral is easiest to write in terms of uh, these field field I, the f states in the field basis. But of course, we could take superpositions of these. We could we could be we could be interested in energy eigenstates, and uh, in that case, you have to sum, you have to sum these, but since the integral is itself a linear operation, we can just sum, sum the integrals. I'll, I'll, and I'll write a formula that makes this um, clear in a second. Yeah? That makes sense. Uh, yes, I'm going to be doing that a lot. I'm going to be doing that a lot. Yeah. Okay, so the... Um, The next thing I want to say is that cutting a path integral defines a quantum state. Uh, so let me give an example first. Uh, if we have, let's talk about the state psi, which is e to the minus tau h acting on one of these field states, phi 1. Well, this I can represent as a path integral. Uh, but it's a path integral where I haven't told you yet what I'm going to put in the upper limit of, uh, in the upper boundary condition. So it's a path integral where I haven't yet told you what boundary condition I'm going to specify. Um, as one of these pictures, um, we could draw it like this with a cut. Uh, so we have so we start with phi one. So we, we read the read the operators from right to left. We start with phi one. We act on it uh, with e to the minus tau h. That evolves. So we start with the state phi one. We evolve the state by an amount tau in the Euclidean time direction, and then uh, we just leave it unspecified. Why does this make sense? Well, what is a quantum state? What is a ket? Uh, it's a linear functional on field data that turns field data into complex numbers. And what is an integral? If I haven't told you the limits yet, it's a linear functional on uh, boundary conditions that turns those boundary conditions into complex numbers. Um, so in terms of the wave function, the wave functional uh, for this quantum state that I've defined here is then just the overlap phi 2 with the state psi. So if I've given you one of these cut path integrals with an open, quantum, with a, with an open cut, uh, then what I'm really telling you uh, is if I come along later and tell you the boundary condition, what boundary conditions you should put into that integral. Um, so you can think of these cut path integrals uh, really as, as defining for you quantum states. The psi wave functional that you define this way, of course, obeys the Schrodinger equation. 
Um, and uh, again, you should think of you should think of the the, the, the things on the left here is giving some you, giving you some instructions uh, for what uh, bounding conditions you're going to put on the cut. Questions? Yeah. In some sense, isn't that the type of linear? Um, yes. Well, it's, Can you repeat the question? Uh, the question was, isn't that anti-linear as opposed to linear? Uh, whatever the right linear or anti-linear one, it's the right one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. Um, now there there are a few there are a few types of path integrals that we often draw, uh, but really you should keep in mind that that any path integral with a codimension one cut is defining for you a quantum state. Okay, so say we're in say we're in two D, then I could do some crazy path integral on some crazy surface, and then I could cut this path integral here. Uh, then this is one of these path integral expressions. It has a it has a codimension one cut on this S one here, and this defines some quantum state X on S one. I don't know what state it is, it's just some crazy state. Again, this is just telling you a prescription to calcul calculate the wave functional um, for the state x by doing the path integral with uh, some boundary conditions at the cut. The most important state that we construct this way is probably the ground state. Uh, so if we evolve in Euclidean time, if we start with any state and we evolve in Euclidean time long enough, uh, then we're going to project that onto the vacuum. So this is going to be given approximately by um, e to the minus tau times the vacuum energy uh, times the vacuum state as tau goes to infinity, just because evolution in, me, evolution in Euclidean time damps excitations. And if you do it long enough, you damp all the excitations, and you land yourself in the ground state. Therefore, uh, the ground state uh, as a path integral is proportional to, and, I'm, and with these path integral diagrams, um, I won't always write the normalizations or the proportional twos, but we have to, I won't necessarily be writing normalized states. We'll have to come back and worry about that when the time comes. Uh, but we can represent the ground state uh, by a uh, path integral where we do, uh, where we integrate over a half space. So, so I can't draw this going all the way to infinity, so I just drew it this way. Uh, but this is supposed to be a half, a half space. So if we, so for example, if we want to calculate, if we want to find the uh, ground state on the plane R d minus one, uh, then we're going to do the path integral over half of R d, and uh, the point is that the boundary conditions at the bottom don't matter. They just get, um, they just get washed away by evolving long enough in Euclidean time. So all we really have to impose down at infinity is regularity. We just can't do anything singular down there. And then this is going to give us the vacuum state. What about the general ground Sorry? What about the general ground state? The, the degenerate what? Ground state. Degenerate ground state? Um, yeah, then if, if, there are, if there's more than one of these, uh, then this step was so the question was about degenerate ground states. If there's more than one of these, then this step was a little too quick, and we have to worry about that. But I won't um, be 
talking about any any theories with the degenerate ground state. So that was the that was the path integral on a half of uh, of Euclidean space. Of course, we can do this on any space that we care about. If we want to find the ground state on a sphere S d minus one, uh, then we can similarly do the path integral on a semi-infinite cylinder, uh, and uh, that'll give us uh, the ground state on the sphere. If we want to calculate uh, correlation functions, uh, then say something like zero. Let's start easy. Let's start with correlation functions at time zero. So just correlation functions in space. So if we insert an operator at t equals zero, position x1 an operator at t equals 0, position x2. Uh, then uh, to turn this into a path integral, we're just going to read it from right to left. First, we need to prepare the ground state. So uh, we do the integral over the lower half plane. That prepares for us the ground state. Uh, then we're going to insert our two operators, say it here in here. And then we have the out state is also the vacuum state. Um, since it's on the left now, that's going to be a path integral over the upper half plane. Uh, the, the Hermitian conjugate just swaps the upper half and the lower half. Um, so now we just do the path integral up here. In terms of an actual formula, uh, this is just shorthand for integral d phi um, phi phi e to the minus s e, um, where the path integral is now on Euclidean R d, and we've inserted some operators um, where those operators are in the operator language. Yeah, it has to, yeah, when I say any, the question was whether you can really start with any state. It has to have some vacuum in it. Um, so the, the answer is no. It really, it, a generic state, I should say, that has some vacuum in it. If it has the wrong quantum numbers, it won't have any vacuum in it. Any other questions at this point? Well, this is the ground, the ground state is the ground state. And if you want to consider a finite temperature state, that's a different state. And we're going to talk about how to do that state in a little bit. So um, this two-point function that I've just written, uh, the correlation function on the plane, which is a function of tau 1, x1, and tau 2, and x2 is uh, in Q of t is first of all singular only at coincident points, um, and secondly single valued um, on two copies of Rd. In other words, we're, if we define this Euclidean correlation function and we really stick to Euclidean space, when I say it's singular only at coincident points, um, I'm viewing this as a function in Euclidean signature. And this thing is going to be, this thing is related to the correlation functions in Lorentzian signature, but when we stick to Euclidean signature, uh, this has a very simple analytic structure. 
uh, it's singular coincident points and single valued. So for example, if we're working on the plane, the Euclidean plane, uh, and then we view that as a function of this point here, and we take this around uh, another operator insertion, then it has to come back to itself under this transformation. There can't be any uh, branch cuts. Um, sorry, there can't be any, but it has to be single valued when we, when we take it around. So if there's some branch cut, uh, then everything has to cancel uh, if you take it all the way around. This is just a statement that uh, local operators have no ordering in Euclidean signature. When we go to Lorentzian, things will get more complicated. We can use operators to make states. Um, so uh, I wasn't here for Xi's earlier lectures. He probably talked about the state operator correspondence. Um, what I'm going to say is related to that, but slightly different. Um, in any quantum field theory, you can create a dense set of states in Hilbert space by inserting operators in Euclidean. This doesn't rely on conformal invariance. This is just always true. Uh, so for example, I can define a state psi, which is some local operator acting on the vacuum, uh, where that operator is inserted at negative imaginary time. So in my path integral picture, that's something like this. We do the path integral. Um, uh, sorry, there's a cut here. We do the path integral on the lower half plane with uh, phi inserted somewhere in the lower half plane. What does conformal symmetry add to this? What conformal symmetry adds um, is that it gives you the arrow in the other direction. In all theories, you can, um, whether the precise statement is that the states that I can make this way, in any theory, the states that I can make this way are dense. Um, in CFT, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the two, the two things, between the states and the local operators. So what it really gives you is it, the, the important thing it gives you is the arrow in the other direction. The reason for that is if I take a, if I take a let's compare states on a sphere versus operators at a point. So states are co-dimension, states are really associated to co-dimension one surfaces, whereas operators are co-dimension, are associated to points, co-dimension D. Okay, so um, you can always take an operator, draw a sphere around it, and say, oh, I created a state with that operator. What you need conformal invariance for, or at least scale invariance, is going the other direction because scale invariance allows you to take a state shrink it by a scale transformation and use that state to define a local operator. So there's always operators to states in CFT, you get states to operators. Um, Okay, I'm not sure I followed that, but sorry. If if you have, if you create a state by inserting two operators in the in the unit sphere, then clearly you can go backwards and take that state on the unit sphere and and view it as two operator insertions. But, yeah, but you you're saying say something different. Ah, okay, that's right. Um, well, it's it's an operator. It's just not right. Um, well. 
it's it's an infinite. My my one operator is an infinite sum of your of your operators, but I think I could still call it a local operator. It's just not primary. The Hermitian conjugate uh, is defined to take the complex conjugate, sorry, to take the conjugate of the operator. If, there's a, if it's a real operator, we can ignore the dagger on the operator. Uh, but uh, it also acts on uh, the coordinates. But it's the coordinates in Minkowski space, uh, so not the coordinates in Euclidean space. Um, so when we take the conjugate of an operator in, uh, that's created like this by inserting in Euclidean space, it reflects across uh, the tau equals zero plane. Uh, so this state psi is normalizable. Yeah. Uh, no. The que so the question was, if I created a state with two operators like this, would there be any meaning to writing it in different orders? And the answer is no, because these things are for the same reason as before. The, these can be moved around each other, and they're single value. So the norm squared of this state that we just defined uh, is just has a phi at phi dagger minus tau x phi of tau x, uh, which is the path integral uh, so we do the path integral on the lower half plane to make to make the state with a phi insertion, and then the conjugate is just the same path integral on the upper half plane with the same operator inserted. And this is finite because I said that uh, the two-point function in the quantum field theory um, in Euclidean space has singularities only at coincident points. It's also positive It's positive by assumption. Uh, we could say, well, depending on what your assumptions are, uh, this is one of the axioms when you work in when you start a Euclidean signature and try to define a quantum field theory, or you have, if you have some particular uh, example in mind, you can check it. Uh, that um, things like this are positive. So the statement of reflection positivity is that anything that looks like a norm uh, is positive. Anything that looks like a norm squared is positive. So correlation functions uh, like this can be interpreted can be interpreted as norms, uh, and are therefore positive. Uh, more complicated things like with more insertions but which are uh, reflection symmetric across the tau plane those are positive of course we we can put these uh, which which plane we pick doesn't matter uh, so in in Euclidean signature which plane we pick doesn't matter so this correlation function uh, is also positive. Now that's sort of obvious because we could have just rotated, uh, but in more complicated situations, uh, this becomes less obvious. So that's why I said it. Uh, this also applies to superpositions. Basically, it's just the statement that anything looks like a norm squared um, has to be positive. Um, If we insert something in Minkowski space, well, we're free to do that. We're free to talk about correlation functions in Minkowski space. Uh, but uh, for a, an operator insertion like this, 
for real t is not normalizable because according to our definition of the Hermitian conjugate, nothing happens uh, to the, no, the operator doesn't move when you take its conjugate. Uh, so uh, phi dagger phi is infinite, um, and you can't use this to define a normalizable state. Uh, so you always have to, you, you, you can't just go and, you can't create states by inserting in, by inserting at local points in, in Minkowski space. Uh, another way of saying it is that if you insert a local operator in Minkowski space, you're creating uh, energy at all scales. Okay, so, th so there's UV divergences, and that's what's responsible for this infinity. Um, so if you want to create states, you have two options. You can either uh, push things off into imaginary time, like we described here, uh, or you can smear in uh, in you can smear over Minkowski space. So if I were to so if I inserted a point, it's not normalizable, uh, and I won't write the formulas. But you can imagine if I integrated this against a wave packet, uh, that uh, those integrals could become finite, and I could make something uh, that's well defined. That has to include more than one point. It has to include what? So the, the question is, is the region has to include several Lorentzian times. I think the answer is that you have to, well, normally, normally what we do is we, in it, we smear over both time and space. Uh, I'm not sure if that's required. That may depend on the operator what exactly how much smearing you have to do. But certainly you can do it. You can achieve this by smearing over a little, over a little bit of time and a little bit of space. You don't necessarily have to smear over all of, all of Minkowski space. You can integrate against some wave packet with finite support type, type function. Uh, but usually we smear in both time and space. Other questions? Okay, so we're also going to want to do path integrals that uh, go in real time. Uh, and you can do this by uh, extending. So, so often the way we do this is we first create a state by doing a path integral in Euclidean space. And then we evolve that state in Lorentzian time. So the slogan is Euclidean path integrals prepare states Lorentzian path integral does just what you think it does it evolves in T okay so so um, this is how to think about it um, for example uh, this state X that was this crazy genus 2 state that we defined earlier uh, well you can evolve that in time this is e to the minus IHT acting on the state x. Uh, so this is a path integral where uh, first you do this, this first you do this Euclidean path integral to define the state x. Uh, that's this x. And then you evolve it in Lorentzian time. Uh, so we have a state on, we've defined this state on S1 and we're evolving the S1 in Lorentzian time. Um, so I could just draw that as a cylinder revolving for time t. And then we still have our cut up here uh, because, this is a, because this is a cat. And we could sandwich that with some field data or with some other quantum state um, on the left in order to, to fully define our path integral uh, with all our boundary conditions. OK. So far, so good. These pictures are not totally standard, but people do use them a lot, um, or, or something like them. 
And I'm going to use them for the thermal case as well. Um, so stop me now if the pictures don't make sense. We're good. So the weather example would be the I epsilon prescription. The, the, the question is about the I epsilon prescription. Um, Ah, this I epsilon, yeah. Um, yeah, the I epsilon that people usually talk about in QFT, uh, say in, in Peskin and Schroeder, is in momentum space. Uh, but it's related to this rotation in position space that I'm talking about here. Uh, it's the same trick. Um, the I epsilon is just allowing us to, well, we can, we can do an I epsilon, or we can rotate all the way. Uh, all the way over into Euclidean time. And I'm drawing it the latter way, where we just um, do the path. So like to get to the ground state, we just do the path integral in Euclidean. But yes, I epsilons accomplish the same thing. These I epsilons start to get very confusing when you have, like, say, four operators inserted in a thermal state in Minkowski space. Um, now, the pictures get confusing, too. But uh, I, I find the pictures, I can, I can kind of better make sense of them than a bunch of I epsilons and think about what's going on. OK, other questions? So. Now we can start talking about thermal states. The thermal density matrix, um, of course, is rho is e to the minus beta h. This is not normalized. Uh, I'll put back in normalizations when they matter, but let's just work with this unnormalized state for now. Uh, in other words, the operator, the, the matrix elements of rho, are exactly these Euclidean evolution pictures that I was drawing earlier. Uh, so if we start with phi 1, we evolve by an amount beta in imaginary time. And then we put the boundary condition phi 2. Um, so the thermal density matrix is exactly one of these cut path integrals. but Uh, the thermal density matrix is a, is a path integral with two cuts. Right, so a, a state is a, is a functional on field data, to give a number. An operator is a function on two, has two legs. The left, the thing you stick on the left, and the thing you stick on the right. So as a path integral, an operator has two cuts. And uh, those cuts correspond to the two things that you'd put um, to define your matrix elements. So let's calculate the thermal partition function, trace e to the minus beta h. In operator language, uh, we can do this in a field basis where we sum over phi 1 e to the minus beta h phi 1. In terms of these uh, path integral diagrams, this is sum over phi 1 of the path integral on a strip of size beta, where we put the boundary condition phi 1 at both the top and the bottom.
Uh, the question is, how do I do a sum if the spectrum is continuous rather than discrete? Um, let's not worry about that. I, I mean, yeah, I, I'm mostly going to talk about partition function on the circle or on a sphere. Um, I, I don't really want to get sidetracked into that. Yeah. Other questions? OK, but if we're doing the path integral and we're imposing the field phi 1 at the, at the top and bottom, um, then what we're really doing is we've just glued together the top and bottom and declared the top to equal the bottom. OK, so um, what we're really doing uh, is the, this, this is exactly the same as just doing the path integral on a cylinder of, um, of size beta. So there's a, a, an S1 of size beta. Um, since this is the first time I've, I've written the cylinder, let me uh, write the actual formula for this. So this is just the, the Euclidean path integral um, on R d minus 1 times S1 of size beta. We could do the same thing. Um, it, I've, uh, here I wrote R d minus 1, but really I just mean whatever your spatial manifold happens to be. This could be a sphere. It could be some crazy higher topology thing, whatever. Okay, so uh, the conclusion is that traces or the trace glues the cuts together and um, takes the, the thermal density matrix, which is a path integral on a strip, and turns it into the path integral on the cylinder. OK, yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, my phi ones are not energy eigenstates. Uh, we could do the sum in an energy basis, and then this is true. But my phi ones are not are, are not really energy eigenstates. I'm really imagining them as being ba boundary conditions in the path integral, in order to glue this to do this gluing. So the next thing I want to describe is the thermal field double in this language. Um, the, well, let me start with the statement in operator language, and then we'll go back to the path integral. So I want to define uh, the state beta. This is a weird thing to write, because thermal states are, mi are mixed states, uh, but this is an actual state, a pure state beta. Um, which lives in two copies of the Hilbert space and is given by the sum over energy eigenstates of e to the minus beta en over 2 n bar in copy 1 n in copy 2 where the bar stands for a CPT <coughs> conjugation. So why are we doing this? Well, anytime you have a mixed state in quantum mechanics, you can purify it uh, by adding an auxiliary system. And that's exactly what the thermal field double does. So this purifies the mixed state rho beta, that is the partial trace over system 1 of the pure state beta, 
um, is, well, let's do the trace. There's a sum over n. There's a n bar, n bar. There's a e to the minus beta e n. And there's a n n. So what I've done here is I've just multiplied, um, I've just multiplied out the partial trace, and I've used the fact that um, <coughs> m n is delta m n. Um, so this just drops out, and as an operator, the partial trace over system one gives you rho beta in system two. This guarantees that observables in two agree with uh, the observables in the thermal state. So if we calculate in this pure state, we calculate O, which is an operator in system two of x1, O2 of x2, dot, 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 in the state beta in the pure state beta, uh, then this will agree with trace rho beta ox1 ox2 dot dot dot. Yeah. From all the possible verifications of the thermal state, why is it that we are normally interested in this one? The question is, there are lots of purifications. Why are we interested in this one? Um, It's true that we can act with the unitary on system one uh, without affecting our reduced density matrix in system two. Um, so there are lots of different states we could talk about that achieve this. What's nice about this state is that it can be constructed by a very simple path integral. And that's what I'll do next. That's what makes this state special. I mean, in principle, we can always use path integrals. Uh, but in practice, path integrals are good for discussing certain states that you can prepare by Euclidean methods. And this is one of those states, so that's why. Other questions? The other point that I'll just mention, I'm not really going to talk about entanglement very much, uh, but is that in the thermal field double uh, way of formulating the thermal state, uh, the, you have to understand where the entropy comes from. So you have a mixed state. It has some entropy S thermal of beta. Um, and in the thermal field double way of looking at it, where this entropy comes from is entanglement with the other auxiliary system. So the thermal entropy uh, of the original thermal state is the entanglement entropy um, of systems one and two in the state beta. These are two totally independent uh, quantum field theories, the QFT1 and QFT2. Uh, they don't interact. There's no, there's no couplings in the Hamiltonian. Uh, but we've prepared the system in an entangled state. The thermal field double state is clearly entangled. There are correlations between the two systems. And it's the entanglement that results uh, in the thermal entropy of the reduced state. And you'll hear more about, a lot more about that, um, I think, probably from the other Tom, um, but not so much for me.
Okay, so as I answered, as I said in response to this question, uh, the reason we like this state is because we can prepare it by a path integral. To do that, uh, let me start by, okay, this is where my, my drawing skills are not going to keep up very well, but I'll do my best. Stop me if this doesn't make sense. Okay, so let's start with a cylinder. We said that, we, we said that Z uh, was the path integral on the cylinder. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take this cylinder and uh, we're going to slice it down the middle uh, like this with a plane uh, that cuts the cylinder in half and, and puts two cuts. So the two cuts will be here and then one that's sort of in the back. that makes sense? I've taken the cylinder and I've lopped it in half uh, to make a half cylinder. The top half of this drawing uh, is just a strip. Of size beta over 4. Uh, sorry, 2. Why did I write 4? Beta over 2. OK. So now we've um, cut it in half. And uh, we're going to interpret this as the state beta. OK, so why, how can we, what does it mean to interpret this as the state beta? Uh, well, earlier I said when, when a path integral has two cuts, you should interpret it as an operator one thing on the right, one, one thing that, that tells you what field data to plug in on the right of the operator and one on the left. Uh, but you can always reinterpret that as a state in two copies of the system. Okay, so if you have two cuts in a path integral, um, you can either interpret that as an operator uh, on one copy of the, of the theory or as a state in two copies of the theory. Uh, and so the way that we're constructing the thermal field double is to use this second interpretation. In other words, um, what? The the yeah, in the, that's why there's a CPT conjugation in the thermal field double. Um, so in other words, what, so what are these pictures? These are, just, these are just cartoons, but always when I draw these cartoons, I'm giving you a prescription for how to calculate matrix elements, right? So uh, what, the, what, the, what the matrix elements, uh, what this picture is telling you is that to calculate matrix elements of the thermophile double state uh, with two copies of, maybe I shouldn't call it phi 1 and phi 2, I'll call it no, that's okay. If I, to calculate matrix elements with, with two copies of the field data, um, that you should um, equate these to that path integral there with field data phi 1 in one cut and phi 2 in the other, which is the same uh, as calculating it with the square root of the density matrix. because. Uh, that ha that's a strip that's half the size. Right? It's a, the density matrix was a strip of size beta. This is a strip of size beta over 2. Um, so this, is, this picture is just giving us a, a prescription for how to calculate these matrix elements. Um, and you can check that uh, this quantum state that we've written there obeys, uh, has, has these matrix elements. Um, okay, check. This is true. Okay, so, so that, that's how we know that this path integral uh, is really the path integral for the thermal field double. 
Uh, it's because what we mean by this path integral is this prescription for matrix elements. And uh, if you take this expression in terms of the actual state, those are the matrix elements you get. Uh, because that is that e to the minus. Sorry, did I, where did it go? Here, this one. <laughs> this, this, this formula, this expression for the state gives uh, that formula for the matrix elements. So what is this state? Um, well, OK, the next, what I'm going to describe is pretty vague. Um, but this is uh, sort of a, a way to think about it. Um, well, <coughs> let's start with beta, very, beta equals 0 or beta very small. Okay, so then we're doing a path integral on this little tiny strip. And um, if you do a path integral on a little tiny strip, then what you find is uh, a system where the top and the bottom are locally perfectly correlated because the path integral hasn't done anything. Right? You start with some state here. The path integral does basically nothing. So it's perfectly correlated with whatever it started with. Um, and nothing has been, nothing has, no information or no, nothing about the state has been transmitted from a point here to a point there. So you just end up with perfect local correlations uh, between the two halves of the system. So um, at beta equals 0, another way you can think of it is, say you have a, a system, say you have just a bunch of spins or qubits, and you want to prepare them in the thermal field double state. So you have a spin chain. You're going to double the spin chain um, and then prepare them in this state. If you prepare them at beta equals 0, that is infinite temperature, then what you're preparing is just a superposition where there are perfect lo local correlations between the different states. So if there's a, if there's a, if there's a one, if there's a zero in system one, there's a zero in system two. If there's a one in system one, there's a one in system two. Um, so you just have these perfect local correlations between system one and system two, and no correlations uh, if you if you look at spins that are separated in space. So it's this ultra local correlation. Uh, in, a, in a state with beta not equal zero, well now the path integral uh, has some time to actually spread stuff out. The Hamiltonian is local though, so it's not going to spread stuff out all over the place. It's not going to spread stuff out all over the system. You're not going to have uh, it, so say you, say you do the path integral on a strip like this. Well, the Hamiltonian hasn't acted for long enough to, to spread stuff out from here all the way to there because the Hamiltonian uh, is local. Uh, but it has had enough time to sort of spread it out over some window, over some range. Um, and this is not a strict light cone because we're not evolving in Lorentzian time. But there is something that acts a little bit like a light cone in the sense that uh, there's, a, there's a region of size beta where the correlations are spread out. And the correlations will be exponentially small uh, beyond that window. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, the, the, the comment or the question was, is this a field theory version of the Lee Robinson bound? Yeah, the Lee Robinson bound is the statement that, well, no, it's not really that. So, so the Lee Robinson bound is a statement that in, in real-time evolution in any quantum mechanics system with a local Hamiltonian, stuff doesn't spread out uh, beyond some effective light cone, except for exponentially small tails. This is a little different because it's in Euclidean signature, so I don't know if I would call it. I don't, I don't know if I would call it Lee Robinson, although it, it has a similar origin. It's the fact that the Hamiltonian is local.
So now let's look at thermal two-point functions. Uh, so we're interested in uh, an operator at tau 1, x1, an operator at tau 2, x2, at temperature beta, which is um, trace e to the minus beta h times OO with those same arguments put in there. Uh, this, uh, by the same argument that we gave for the, for the vacuum state, um, you can turn this into a path integral, and the path integral you get is just the one that you'd expect. It's the path integral on the cylinder uh, of size beta with uh, operators inserted at these points. Okay, so if I take t if I take these tau's and x's all to be real, so that I'm working completely in Euclidean signature, then uh, I'm just doing a path integral on the cylinder with some operators inserted at points on the cylinder. So the picture here I'm drawing is appropriate when the tau's and x's are real. Well, it's obvious from this picture uh, that this two-point function that I'll call g beta is periodic in imaginary time. So it's equal, so g of tx is equal to g of t plus i beta x. This is almost what's called the KMS condition, except that the KMS condition is a bit more general. Um, um, so I'm going to give a second derivation of this just using operator language um, as well. So the trace derivation uh, we're interested in this trace row O of t minus i beta x o of 0. Um, let me now give these different names, o1 and o2, so that we can get the full KMS condition. Um, then the idea is just to rewrite this operator here as e to the beta h um, o of tx e to the minus beta h. Uh, and then we have rho itself is e to the minus beta h. So we could just manipulate this trace and turn it into something that looks again like a two-point function. These two thermal factors cancel. Uh, and then we can use the cyclicity of the trace to move this other operator over. So we get trace e to the minus beta h times O2 of 0, O1 of t comma x. This is what's usually called the KMS condition. <coughs> so it says that G12 beta of T minus I beta x. Uh, in the second one here, we can use translation invariance to just move the, the, the t and the x over here. So we get g beta to 1 of minus t minus x. If these are identical scalar operators, uh, then we get back 
just periodicity uh, on the Euclidean cylinder. Uh, but the KMS condition, the, the full KMS condition written this way is more general. It applies also if the operators are um, inserted at different Lorentz, inserted in some with a, with a difference in Lorentzian time. So the difference in, in the Lorentzian time, there can actually be a delta t here in Lorentzian time, uh, whereas that's sort of hard to see in the picture, in the, in the Euclidean picture. Uh, clearly, when I was writing this, when I was drawing this, the, the real time, they, they were at the same real value of t. Uh, they were just separated in, in imaginary t. Okay, so this is the general condition. What? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Does somebody know? What is it? Kubo Martin Schringer. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. Let's see. When do I stop? At four minutes. Okay. Um, so let me just write up the analytic structure of this thing. This is going to be important. OK, so um, the analytic structure, we can sort of understand by, by thinking about the path integral. OK, so um, I want to think about the analytic structure as a function of, as a function of tau. So we have g beta of tau x, uh, but now I'm going to allow tau to be complex uh, so that we can capture both uh, real time and imaginary time. We can think about this, uh, we can sort of get some intuition for this by thinking about the path integral, although these, these start to get hard to draw. Okay, so here's, Here's the path integral that prepares the thermal state at time zero. And let's insert one of our operators at the origin. So we just have um, O of zero. And then we're interested in calculating a two-point function where the other operator um, can be moved into, into Lorentzian signature. So when we do that, um, we evolve this into Lorentzian time. Um, and the reason it gets complicated is because there are singularities now, not just at coincident points in Lorentzian signature, uh, but along the light cones of the first operator insertion. So now uh, we have our other operator, O of tau x. And as we move this operator, O of tau x, around in, in complexified tau, um, there's more complicated ways to hit singularities. We're going to hit a singularity if we hit operator O, uh, but uh, we have to worry about the fact that um, that creates this branch cut here, um, and we're going to see that in the analytic structure. So we, can, we hit a singularity as we approach that light cone. So if we draw this on the tau plane, then here's what it looks like. Um, so I'm, what, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm fixing, I'm fixing x to something um, and then just moving around tau. OK, I need to. OK, so, so say, we, say we start with the operators just separated, at, separated in x, and then we start going into the real t direction. As we start going into the real t direction, uh, we're going to hit a singularity at the light cone. On this picture, what that says is we started here at tau equals 0. We started going into the real t direction, which is the imaginary tau direction. And uh, we hit a singularity here. OK, so this point here is the OO light cone. And it's located at tau equals i times the magnitude of x. So this is a singularity. At that singularity, uh, there can be a branch cut, and typically is a branch cut. Uh, so we get a branch cut, um, and conventionally, we always draw the branch cuts vertically on the tau plane. That's a choice. It's just a convention. Uh, but everybody's always going to, 
assume that your branch cuts are vertical. Uh, similarly, if we were to go backwards in time here, we would hit a past light cone. And uh, so there's a cut going downwards this way. OK. What else do we know about this thermal correlation function? We know that it's periodic and imaginary time. So um, there's really a repeating. It's really repeating here with, um, so tau is going this way. If we, if we start here and we go uh, distance beta in imaginary time, we've just gone around the cylinder. So it has to repeat. So what we really get on the tau plane is a periodic repeating structure of branch cuts that go like this. Uh, and so on. Now, we don't really have to think about anything past this one, uh, because everything is determined by what happens in this fundamental domain here by the KMS condition. OK, so this is the analytic structure of the thermal two-point function. Um, let me expound on the KMS condition a little bit more. OK, so, say, so uh, what we can also see here is uh, the effect of operator ordering in Lorentzian signature. OK, so um, when we, so say, we're, say we're, we're moving this operator upward towards the, light, towards the light cone. When we hit that singularity, that's us going up here on the tau plane, we see a singularity. We have to decide which way to go. OK, so down here, there was just one thing that you could call O1, O2. It was the Euclidean correlator. There was no operator ordering. Uh, we don't have to worry about the order. But as soon as we get here, there's an ambiguity in uh, that correlation function. And that ambiguity is what we use notation for uh, and put the operators in different order. OK, so, so as we get up here, if we go a little bit to the right, we're going to get one of the two operator orderings. Um, let's see if I wrote down which one is to the right. OK, I think it's 0, 0,1,2. It really doesn't, it doesn't matter so much for this point. The point is that uh, we get the two operator orderings and going in the two directions. If we go a little bit to the left, then we get 0, 2, 0, 1. So if we're working uh, at a, in a configuration where this operator is inside the future light cone of the other operator, that means we're working somewhere along this branch cut in the tau plane. And when we're working along that branch cut, we have to say whether we're working a little bit to the right or a little bit to the left. And that's the choice of uh, the two operator orderings. The other thing we can see here, uh, well, since this is periodic, if we decide to go a little bit to the left, then uh, we could say that we're over here as well, because this is just shifted over by beta. So that's why there's that, um, in the KMS condition, where did the KMS condition go? Here. Ah, there. <laughs> so that's why in the KMS condition, um, if we, when we, when we go by an amount beta, when we go um, to minus, we go from T to minus T, and we switch the operator order. Okay, so that's, that's going from here on the picture to here on the picture. Uh, we switch the operator ordering and send uh, tau to beta minus tau. So the KMS sends tau to beta minus tau and 1, 2 to 2, 1. So that's what's going on. It's going from this side of, the, it's going the right side of this cut to the left side of this cut. Um, and I'll stop here for today and take questions. Yeah. So just, um, <laughs> are we not flipping the sign of the imaginary part of tau? Um, you mean in this condition? Yeah. So um, we have, uh, Oh. Um, I guess we have a rotational, so we also have this minus x. Oh. Okay. We have a rotational symmetry that we can get rid of that, yeah. Yeah. So is it an assumption that the, it's a, I mean, the, you're saying that this continuity along the branch cut is the compensator? Yes. I'm a, yes. Uh, so where does that come from? So the, the comment was that discontinuity along the branch cut is a commutator. 
Um, where is it coming from? Uh, it's basically coming from the fact that it's coming from the fact that uh, it's coming from the fact that things commute in Euclidean signature. Or the, the, in, in, and, and by the way, this would be much more complicated if we were doing a non-relativistic theory. But in a relativistic theory, um, you have the fact that at time zero, at space-like separation, things commute. So you know that um, at space-like separation, O2 or O1, O2 is equal to O2, O1. And if you have two functions that agree on, if you have two analytic functions that agree on some big domain, then the only way they can disagree elsewhere is by, is by um, the way that you go around some branch cut. Um, so it's, it's really what it, it's, it's locality in, it's locality at time zero that's forcing on you this structure of the analytic structure in, in Lorentzian time. And you, let's see, at, at finite temperature, I'm not sure that we know that. So the question, sorry, the question was, how do we know there are no other singularities on the tau plane? Um, in the vacuum state, there's a picture that's similar to this, minus the, the periodicity. Uh, in that case, it's very easy to see that there are no extra singularities. It's just the fact that there were no extra singularities in Euclidean. At finite temperature, um, I am not sure whether this is, I have to think about whether this is a theorem that we can prove about the two-point function um, or whether this is just the expectation. Um, I'm not sure what the answer is to that question off the top of my head. Yeah. Yes. And then we can get Lorentzian correlators like this by suitable analytical continuation. Yes. So if if I if I satisfy all the constants of modular covariance and crossing symmetry in CFT, then would that be automatic? This KMS would be automatic for all correlators? Yeah, so the the comment was that in in two dimensional CFT we can just map to the cylinder by a conformal transformation and derive all the formulas for these things. And then the question was does it, does it obey all these properties when you do that? Um, and the answer is yes. I'll give that. I'll write the formula for that um, at the beginning of next time, actually. And uh, the the standard formula in terms of cinches obeys. It has exactly this analytic structure on the on the tau plane. All points, it will, it will be automatic. And the KMS will be automatic if I satisfy all modular <coughs> covariance and crossing in CFT for all correlators. Ah. You're, you're asking if the KMS condition is an additional condition on quantum field theories or is built into the uh, usual conditions that we impose on the plane and the torus. Um, the answer is that I, I believe the answer is in two-dimensional field theory is that it's built in uh, because there's a proof that uh, you can get the that you can get that everything is consistent at all genus once you have these conditions on the torus and plane. Uh, but for higher dimensional field theory, um, there isn't really a statement like that. And I'm not even sure. I'm not sure what the story would be there. I'm not even sure we know what the what the amount of data that you'd have to supply in order to fully. Def I don't think we know what data you have to supply in order to fully define a quantum field theory in higher dimensions. So there, I think it's not so clear. Uh, 